This month. 
wisps brooding over a stagnant pool. It was evident to them all that the first who should break the silence, even if he spoke in jest, would cause in the hearts of the others a start and tremor, for each felt that he had almost unwittingly plunged into a ghastly reverie. Henry, at last, said one, again dipping the spoon into the flaming spirit, Hast thou read Hoffman? I should think so, said Henry. What think you of him? Why, that he writes admirably, and moreover, what is more admirable, in such a manner that you see at once he almost believes that which he relates. As for me, I know very well that when I read him of a dark night, I am obliged to creep to bed without shutting my book. I do, said Henry. And what do you think of such romances? said the questioner, addressing the third. I like them much, was the answer. Good. Then I will tell you a strange story which happened to myself. I presumed as much, said Henry. An adventure in which you were the hero, said the third. Yes, I myself. I must again, before I commence, assure you that I am the hero of this strange adventure. Go on then, we will listen. The silver spoon fell from his fingers into the bowl. The flame of the spirit, not enlivened by agitation, faded out little by little, and in a few moments they were in almost complete darkness. A warm light only being thrown upon their legs, by the fire in the stove. He began his story. One midwinter evening, it might have been about a year ago, the weather was just as it is now. The same cold, the same sleet and hail, the same dullness. You know my profession is that of a surgeon, and on that day I had a great many cases to attend so that after having made my last visit, instead of going, as sometimes I did, to the theatre, I made haste home. I then dwelt in one of the most deserted streets of the Faubourg saint germain I was tired, and I quickly got to bed. I extinguished the lamp and amused myself with gazing at my fire, watching the great shadows, which each little flame made dance upon my bed curtain. Then at last my eyes shut, and I fell asleep. It might have been an hour after I closed my eyes, when I felt some person shaking me roughly. I woke with a start, and in not the very best temper, and stirred with some surprise at my nocturnal visitor. It was my manservant. Sir, said he, rise at once, you are sent for to a young lady who is dying. Where does she live? said I. Nearly opposite, but there is a messenger downstairs who will take you to her. I rose, and thinking that at such a moment my toilet was of little consequence, dressed myself in haste. I took my instrument case and followed the man who had come for me. It rained in torrents. Happily, however, I had only the street to cross, and I was almost immediately at the house of the person who required my assistance. She dwelt in a large and aristocratic hotel. I had to cross a wide courtyard and to ascend a stone staircase, which ran up outside the building. Then, passing a vestibule wherein some servants were waiting to show me upstairs, I was at once conducted to the chamber of the sick lady. It was a very large room, furnished throughout with oaken furniture very ancient and beautifully carved. A maidservant showed me into the chamber, and then left me. I went at once to the bedside, carved like the rest of the furniture, with tall pillars running up to some height, supporting a canopy of rich arras, and upon which, pressing a snowy pillow, lay a head more ravishing than ever Raphael dreamt of when he painted his first 
you said, however, that you suffered. More in mind than body, said she with a sigh. You are sad, madam. Oh, deeply so, she returned. But happily, Providence is also a physician and has found for grief a universal panacea. Forgetfulness. But, said I, there are some griefs which kill. True, she said. But the grave and forgetfulness, are they not the same? One is the tomb of the body, the other that of the heart. There is no other difference. But you, madam, how can you suffer grief? You are too high to be touched by it. Sorrow should pass beneath you like clouds pass under the feet of angels. To us come storms and lightning. To you, the blue serenity of heaven. Ah, she said, tis there you deceive yourself. There all the science ends, your knowledge does not reach the heart. Well, said I, try at least, madam, to forget. God sometimes permits a joy to succeed, grief and a smile to follow on our tears. And it is only true that when the heart of one he tries is too wide to refill of itself, and when the wound is too deep to heal without succor, he sends across the path of such a one a soul that we suffer less in suffering together, and that a moment must come when the desolate heart must sleep again with joy, and when the deadly wound must heal. And what is the prescription, doctor, she said, by which you would heal such a wound? That must be according to the patient, I returned. To some I should counsel faith, to others love. You are right, she answered. They are the two sisters of charity who visit the soul. Then ensued a long silence, during which I fixed my eyes upon that sweet countenance, on which the light which peeped through the silken curtains cast such a charming tint, upon those beautiful dresses which now no longer floated over her face like a veil, but which were banded on her temples and were drawn behind her ears. The conversation had taken from the beginning a sad cast, but by this the beautiful being before me seemed more radiant than before, diademed as she was which with the triple crown of beauty, love and grief. Thus I remained gazing at her not so mad as I was on the first evening, but the more collected by her quietude. If that moment had made her mine, I should have fallen at her feet. I should have taken her hands, I should have wept with her as a sister, and whilst I re reverenced her as an angel, she should have consoled her as a woman. But I was yet ignorant with gr what grief it was which she should forget, or what had caused the deep wound still unhealed, and this was what I had to find out. For between the physician and patient, there was not as yet sufficient As she said these words, 
she threw upon me a glance, inexpressibly sweet and confiding, and added, You will come, come soon, will you not? I carried her hand to my lips, and I retired. When I got home, I seemed in a dream. My windows looked upon hers. I remained all the day looking at them, and all the day they were closed and dark. I forgot everything for this woman. I slept not, I, eat, I ate nothing. That evening I fell into a fever. The next morning I was delirious, and the next evening I was dead. Dead, cried his hearers. Dead, answered the narrator, with a conviction in his voice which words alone cannot give. Dead as Fabian, the cast of whose dead face hangs from that wall. Go on, whispered the others, holding their breath. The hail still rattled against the windows, and the fire had so nearly died out that they threw more wood on the feeble flame, which penetrated the darkness of the studio, and cast a faint light upon the pale face of him who told the story. He resumed. From that moment, I felt nothing but a numbing chill, and a slight but still freezing motion. The latter was doubtless that of being put into the grave. I had been buried for some time. I do not exactly know how long, for there is no time keeping in the grave. When I heard someone calling my name, I shook with cold and fear, without being able to answer. After a lapse of some moments, I was again called. I made an effort to speak, and then felt the bandage which wrapped me from head to foot. It was my shroud. At last, I managed feebly to articulate, Who calls? Tis I, said a voice. Who art thou? I, 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 was the answer, and the voice grew weaker, as if it was lost in the distance, or as if it was but the icy rustle of the trees. A third time my name sounded on my ears, but now it seemed to run from tree to tree, as if it whistled in each dead branch, so that the entire cemetery repeated it with a dull sound. Then I heard a noise of wings, as if my name, pronounced in the silence, had suddenly awakened a troop of night birds. My hands, as if by some mysterious power, sought my face. In silence I undid the shroud which bound me and tried to see. It seemed as if I had awakened from a long sleep. I was cold. I then recalled the dread fear which oppressed me, and the mournful images by which I was surrounded. The trees had no longer any leaves upon them, and seemed to stretch forth their bare branches like huge spectres. A single ray of moonlight which shone forth showed me a long row of, row of tombs forming an horizon around me, and seeming like the steps which might lead to heaven. All the vague voices of the night which seemed to preside at my awakening were full of terror. I turned my head and sought for him who called me. He was seated at my side, watching me, his head leaning on his hands and his face pregnant with a terrible look and clothed with a horrible smile. Fear ran like an electric shock through me. Who art thou? said I, with an endeavour to gather up all my strength. And why dost thou awaken me? To render you a service, he answered. Where am I? In the graveyard. Who art thou? A friend. Leave me to sleep, said I. Listen, cried he to me. Dost thou remember aught of the earth? No. Dost thou regret anything? No. How long hast thou been asleep? I know not. I will tell you, he said. Thou hast been dead two days, and the last word you uttered was the name of a woman instead of that of the Lord. Therefore, if Satan wished to possess it, your soul belongs to him. Dost understand me? Yes, I answered. And dost thou 
millions of souls per day. I really fancy that I shall be obliged to enlarge my place of accommodation. I understand your triumph, I muttered to myself as I hasted onwards. Indeed, said Satan, with a sombre and a melancholy air, do you fear me then, since you see me face to face? Am I so repulsive? Let us reason a little. What would become of your world without me? It would die of spleen. It is I who invented gold gambling. Tis I love business. Tis I. Think of these things I cannot, for the life of me, understand the spite which you men seem to bear against me. Your poets, for instance, who keep talking of an ideal love, cannot understand that in raving of the love which exalts, they point out the way to that which debases, that in seeking a Diana they have managed to find an Aphrodite. Now look, for instance, to yourself. You have just risen from the dead. You are yet as cold as a corpse, and yet you seek the embraces of love. You see evil survives death, and that a man who has lived a wicked life would, if he were put to the proof, prefer an eternity of his own passions to an eternity of pure and heavenly happiness. I interrupted him with, Shall we get soon there? For the horizon seemed to grow lighter every moment, and still we did not seem to adva advance an inch. How impatient you are, ejaculated the fiend, querulously. You must know that over the great gate of the cemetery there is a cross, and that that cross is a kind of barrier or custom house to me. As I generally travel about for purposes which the cross forbids, I should be obliged to make the sign of it upon my forehead to pass it. Now I am willing enough to carry on my own little peccadilloes, but the fiend himself revolts at sacrilege, so, as I have told you before, we can't pass there. But never mind that, follow me. I have promised to and conducted you to a ball, and I will keep my word. My word, added he sardonically, is well known to be as good as my bond. There was, in all this irony of the fiend, something so fatal, cold and devilish, that almost each word which dropped from his mouth seemed to freeze me. Still, what I tell you I heard with these ears. I could not drag myself away from my strange companion. We continued to walk for some hundred feet when we came to a wall, before which an accumulation of tombstones formed a kind of flight of steps. Satan placed his foot upon the first, and without any remorse, strode upon the sacred memorials till he reached the top of the wall. I hesitated. I was afraid to follow him, but he held out his hand to me, saying, there is not the slightest danger. You can step upon these paving stones. They are those of some acquaintances of mine. When I reached the place where he stood, he suddenly asked me whether he should show me the town. But I answered, no, no, let us move forward. We therefore leapt down from the wall upon the ground. The moon seemed to veil herself before the bold looks of Satan. The night was cold. All the doors were closed, all the windows darkened, and the streets deserted. From their appearance, one would have imagined that, for a long time past, no foot had transversed those silent streets. Everything around us bore a death-like aspect. It seemed as if, when day came, no one would open their doors, that no head of woman or of child would look out of those dark, that no step would break the silence which fell like a pall upon all around. I seemed to be walking in a city which had been buried some ages. In truth, the town seemed to have been depopulated and the cemetery to have grown full. Still, we went forward without hearing a murmur or meeting even with a shadow. The street stretched for a long way across this fearful city of silence and repose. At last we reached my house. You remember it, said the fiend. 
Yes, replied I suddenly. Let us enter. First, said he, we must open the door. It is I, by the way, who invented the science of opening doors without breaking them in. In fact, I have a second key to all doors and gates, with one exception, that of paradise. We entered. The calm without continued within. It was horrible. I felt as in a dream. I did not breathe nor move. Imagine if you can yourselves entering your chambers after having been dead for two days, finding everything in the same position in which you was during your illness, but wrapped in that dark gloom which death alone can give, and seeing all the objects arranged never again to be disturbed by you. The only thing which seemed to have any motion in it which I had seen since I arose from the tomb was a large clock by the side of which a human being had ceased to exist and which now ticked slowly on counting the hours of my eternity as it had the minutes of my life. I went to the mantel shelf. I lighted a wax candle to assure myself of the existence of everything for all which surrounded me appeared so strange that I could not believe my senses. Every object was real. I saw before me the portrait of my mother with the sm same smile upon her lips, smiling on me now in death as it had before in life. I opened the books which I had read only some few days before my death. Everything was the same. The only alteration was that the linen had been removed from the bed, and that on each chest and drawer there was a seal. As for Satan, he was sitting down upon the tester of the bed, reading attentively the lives of the saints. I passed before a cheval glass, and I saw myself metaphored in my strange costume, wrapped in my winding sheet, my face pale, my eyes heavy and I began to doubt this life which an unknown power had returned to me. I placed my hand upon my heart. It did not beat. I carried my hand to my brow. My brow was cold as ice. So also was my chest. My pulse was, of course, as motionless as my heart. However, memory lived within me and I could move about. The thought was horrible. My eyes and my brain were alone really alive. What was yet more horrible was that I could not detach my eyes from the glass which gave back my figure cold, pale and frozen. Each movement of my lips was reflected by a ghastly and sinister smile. I could not quit my place and I had no power to cry out. The dime piece gave out that dull sound which warns us that it will soon strike. Then it struck two o'clock. A few seconds after, the neighbouring church clock struck also, then another and another, and all was again silent. By the reflection of the glass, I saw that the fiend had fallen comfortably to sleep over the volume he had tried to read. I turned round and called to my reflection in another glass with that pale clearness which a single wax candle in a vast chamber I seemed haunted by myself. Fear reached its culminating point, and I cried out aloud. Satan awoke. Look, said he, not regarding my fear. How you men try to instill virtue into others. Here is this book, absolutely so nonsensical and dull, that I, who have not been to sleep for nearly six thousand years, am obliged to take a nap over it. How is this? Are you not ready? Look at me, I said mechanically. Come, come, answered my companion. Break the seals, take your clothes, and plenty of gold, plenty of gold. Tomorrow, when it is found out, justice will step in and condemn some poor devil for the robbery. And, continued he, condescending for a moment to be vulgar, for the devil is always a gentleman, that will be a little bit of fat for me. I dressed myself in haste, but noticed every time that I touched my forehead or my bosom that they were
was still cold as ice. When ready, I looked at Satan. Shall we see her, said I, in five minutes, and tomorrow, what then? Tomorrow, said he, you may take yourself to your ordinary pursuits and to your common life. I do not do things by halves, without conditions, without any. Let us set out then, I returned. We did so. In a few minutes we were before the house at which I had called some few days previously. Let us go upstairs, said my conductor. He did so. I recognised the grand staircase, the vestibule, the antechamber. The entrance of the saloon was crowded with people. The party was brilliant. The rooms seemed to glitter, as it were, with light, flowers, jewels and beautiful women. When we entered, they were dancing. I cannot tell how I felt, seeing all these things and with yet the presence of the grave about me. I took Satan aside and whispered to him, Where is she? In her boudoir, he answered. I waited till the dance was finished. I then crossed the saloon. The huge mirrors, by the light of the chan chandeliers, reflected in my pale and sombre figure and I recognised the death-like smile which had so frozen me. But here, at least, I was safe. Here was no solitude, but a crowd of joyous people. No cemetery, but a ballroom. No tomb, but beauty, ravishing beauty. For one moment, dreaming of her for whom I came, I forgot whence I came. Arrived at the door of the boudoir, I glanced in and saw Though she sat, more beautiful than beauty's self, chaste as a statue of Diana. I stopped for an instant in an ecstasy. She was clothed in a dress of dazzling whiteness, with bare arms and shoulders. I thought I saw upon one of her arms the little red point where I had bled her. Perhaps, however, this was far more fancy than anything else. When I appeared, she was surrounded by handsome young men, to whose vapid talk she did not, however, seem to listen. Raising her beautiful eyes mechanically, she saw me, seemed to hesitate for a moment, and then, with a sweet smile, she quitted the rest and came to me. You see, said she, I am quite strong. As she said this, the orchestra again struck up. She continued. And you can make proof of it if you wish. Let's, let us waltz together. She then added some words to someone at her side. I looked towards him. It was Satan. You have kept your word, said I. I thank you for it, but this woman must become mine this very night. Thou shalt have her, he said coldly. But wipe your face before you dance. There is a worm crawling upon your cheek. So saying, he departed, leaving me more cold and ghastly than before. To restore my feelings, I pressed the arm of her for whom I had come from the grave, and thus I entered the ballroom with her. It was one of those delicious, entrancing waltzes where all those who surround us seem to disappear, and we see none but ourselves. So we waltzed with our eyes fixed on each other, till they seemed to make a language of their own. Hers seem to say, I am young and beautiful, and to him who possesses me all the beauties of my heart and soul will be revealed. Still the waltz went on. The measure ceased at last, and we were alone. She leaned upon my arm and turned her fine eyes upon me, with a look which seemed to say, I love you. I led her back into the saloon. It was deserted. She sat down reclining on an ottoman and turned her eyes to me half closed as if with love rather than fatigue I leaned towards her ah, said I if you only knew how I, lo how I love you I know it, she answered I love you equally as well I would give my soul, said I earnestly to possess you as my bride the eyes of the lady lit up with a fire which resembled those of the fiend their light seemed to enter into my soul. Listen, she said anxiously. In a few moments we shall be alone. That door leads to my chamber. Wait till all are gone, and we will ratify the compact. The door opened silently and then shut upon me. I was alone in the chamber where first I had seen her. There was the same mysterious 
passing of vigil of tears and prayers in remembrance, remembrance of me. The thought was fearful. I felt full of remorse. Tears came into my eyes. I rose and looked at myself again in the glass. My eyes, before dull, seemed to brighten with resolution. I prayed within myself and determined to rush from the present danger. I saw behind me a pale and motionless figure. It was my mistress. She had just entered the room. I rushed past her through the half-open door, and before I thought of anything else, I regained my own home. In the sanctity of that, I remained in meditation and prayer. I was safe from the intrusion of the fiend who tempted me. Not so, however, were my thoughts. In the morning, which slowly dawned, the beauty to which I had so blindly bow bowed myself seemed to have regained its power. I forgot my good resolutions. I threw behind my prayers. I again gave myself up to the passions which devoured me. I determined again to seek her. 